Okay. Uh, good morning. I'm Kerry Binding from the University of South Wales. Um, I'm in the Hypermedia Research Group, uh, led by Professor Douglas Tudhope uh, in the uh, uh, School of Computing and Maths. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, bridging data via semantic relationships and finding new links between data, through, uh, mainly through the uh, structure of a thesaurus. Uh, in the background here, we can see uh, a bridge over the river Taff, near pont de -Priv in South Wales. Um, this is a bridge um, that connected two communities. Uh, and it was the fourth one in that place. It took them four goes to get one that actually stood up. Uh, it wasn't very practical. You couldn't get horses and carts over it very easily. But it's still there today, although there's a dirty great road bridge there now to take the practical traffic. You can still walk over it. Anyway, I digress. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a case study, archaeological case study we did towards the end of the Ariadne project. It involved um, item level semantic integration, um, taking extracts from five separate archaeological data sets, plus um, some output from natural language processing that have been applied to 25 separate grey literature reports in a number of different languages. And we combined all that uh, data. 23,000 records referencing 37,000 different objects, 38,000 objects. We transformed all the data to RDF um, using the CDOC CRM model, and we referenced uh, the AAT, the, the Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus, um, in terms of uh, subject metadata concepts. And then the RDF was aggregated to a virtual or triple store, creating a million triples for what that's worth. Um, and then we created a little demonstration query builder over the top to make it easier to, to um, create queries and to cross-search all of this data, cross-search the multilingual data, and to browse the integrated data sets. Um, yeah, I know it's a little bit small. That's the kind of data model we used. We only used the base CDUX CRM. We didn't use any of the extensions. So it's basically man-made objects in the middle, uh, production events associated with them with time spans, uh, sampling events, part removal, events, um, and the, the actual records that were referenced in these objects were, were models as information objects uh, referring to them. Yeah. Go fairly fast. Um, so there's the general architecture of what we did. We have the, um, the various data sets that we took from, from ADS and from a number of other, other sources. We did a cleansing and normalization process on them because a lot of the data wasn't clean enough to really search across it properly and I'll go into a little more, more detail on that. Uh, we did transformation of the data using a little tool that we've, we've created called Stellito. It's a kind of cut down version of our old uh, Stella tool that's kind of cross platform and very quick and nice and easy to use. And we also directly imported the Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus into the system so we could use the structure of it within our queries in combination with the data that we'd transformed. And then the grey literature, I don't know too much about this side of it. This was done by um, uh, Andreas Lohidis, who was in, at the university at the time, and he did some nice natural language processing, uh, named entity recognition stuff, pulling, pulling out objects, uh, names of objects and materials and dates and things from the, the various documents. And so we combined all of that into the triple store, and then we had a nice little uh, uh, query builder on top of that that was only using Sparkle queries to... to um, communicate with the data so there were no extra services or, or back-end structure that we had to um, deploy there. So how do we discover connectivity between objects traditionally? Um, there's a number of different ways. It's usually by finding some sort of familiarity, some, some sort of things that they have in common. Yeah. And so we could do it at the, the, the level of raw textual matches. As we can see, with, with a lot of le legacy data sets, that can be um, far from satisfactory. We can do data cleansing and clustering, and, and data cleansing in itself can create or, or can rediscover connections that should have been there in the first place due to bad uh, data entry policies. Um, but there's, there's things that you search for, and you just don't find them unless the data is clean. Um, and then matching uh, to a controlled vocabulary can really help if we reconcile a lot of the, the, the different terms to a, a common controlled vocabulary, then we can search across multilingual data afterwards. And then that gets interesting because once we've matched the data to a common controlled vocabulary, we can utilize the structure of that controlled vocabulary to find additional connectivity. And that's the kind of thing 
that I'm talking about here. So we can find equivalence, relationships, synonyms, uh, different, different words that actually mean the same concept. Uh, hierarchically related terms, um, associatively related terms, and that's quite interesting in terms of the art and architecture thesaurus because they have some quite interesting associative relationships going on. So here's a, a typical sort of long tail of values that result from free text data entry. And you can see immediately some of the problems that you're going to get if you try and search this stuff. Um, exact textual matches in a single field, in a single table, will usually suggest some sort of connection between those records. But as in the case with some of these, you're not going to get that connection immediately without some sort of fuzzy matching. And fuzzy matching is going to bring its own problems in terms of uh, suggesting false positives. Um, and if you try and pull the data together and aggregate it, you're going to have further problems. It's going to be really unreliable. So you can see it as a multilingual example there. If you pull together French data and English data and you try and search on the word coin, you're going to get very different results because coin, I believe in French, is a corner. Very different. Um, so we can, we can see some areas where we can clean up the data. Yeah, we can remove some of the unnecessary punctuation, which is put in, I think it's put in as a, as a way of being a bit more descriptive, but it's, it's in the wrong place. You know, you should have a separate feel for being descriptive. And, and if, if you're trying to index things, stick to very controlled terms. Uh, but we can see immediately connections between those things, and we need to sort those out. So you can normalize the white space, normalize case, split some of these concatenated terms out, and maybe cluster things by similarity of, of the text to try to identify things which are the same. And the Open Refine tool that Ethan Gruber was talking about yesterday can do a lot of this. Uh, it's very, very good for this, and we found a lot of little tricks we could do with it and scripts that we could put into it to, to do all of this automatically. And then aligning to control vocabulary to try to, to iron out some of this stuff further. We, we took the clean, cleanse terms, aligned them to uh, Getty Art and Architecture Thorsaurus concept identifiers. And as you can notice, one of these things not quite like the others. Yeah, they're all materials, but the last one is a species. Yeah, and we, we kind of know what they meant when they did that, but uh, we found that uh, de dendrochronological oriented data was observed using a mixture of these sort of materials and genus or family or species. Yeah. So when we want to try and find the connection between those, how exactly do we do it? And I'll, I'll show how. So there's also uh, equivalence links within the thesaurus. This, this is the immediate advantage we get once we've um, aligned to the thesaurus. And we can use this data in the alignment process. Uh, we have multilingual synonyms existing already in the, in the AAT. So they're all the different terms, but the concept is the same thing. Yeah? And so we can coalesce our data around these common identifiers, and we've immediately got new connections between multilingual data. So records referencing any of these things are actually referring to exactly the same material. And then we have hierarchical links. Um, so any, any records referencing our AAT identifier for willow, the wood, yeah, have a connection to any records that are referencing any of the narrower concepts in the AAT hierarchy. Yeah? So we've got another um, set of, of connections that we can identify there. So I mentioned about how do, how do we get the connection between the, the, the genus or the, or the family, uh, the salix and the willow. Well, there's another set of, of relationships in the art and architecture thesaurus, associative links, um, RTs, related term, that's, that's what's uh, referred to in, in thesaurus parlance. Um, so some of the data set records were indexed as willow, some as indexed as salix. There's no explicit link in the original data sets between those two things. Yeah? So you're not going to find um, the connection. But the AAT does define a sort of specialized version of, of related term, uh, which connects these two things. And so we can use that associative link as a bridge, yeah? going back to my bridge analogy in the first place, um, to connect between those two distinct hierarchies. Yeah. And then we can use those inherent hierarchical relationships to expand the query to also include all of those narrower terms, the, the hierarchical links. Yeah? So if we're searching for willow, we should get back all the things below it, and salix, and all the things below that. Yeah, so we've, we've got, we're using the, the inherent structure within the thesaurus to find new connections between things in the data. So here's a, a practical example of querying using 
dot that specialized associated link. So we see there's a, there's a specialized type of link, which is a, a subclass, a subproperty, sorry, of uh, uh, SCOS related in, in the uh, Getty AATs data. And so you have the two concepts linked together in a, in a bi-directional way, two different relationships there. And there's, I've, I've given the URI of the, of the Getty's uh, Sparkle endpoint, so you can actually try this out. That's the query I did. And here are the things that are coming back. So you can see we've got Salix, we've got Willow, and we've got all the things below them. So if you're querying that in, the t in terms of data that's connected to any of these IDs, then you've got connections between them all. Yeah. And that has the uh, important advantage that you're increasing recall without sacrificing precision. Yeah. So here's an uh, example of the, the little demonstrator that we built to, to go over the top of this so that we didn't have to do raw Sparkle queries like that because they were a bit uh, scary and frightening. Um, so we're searching for records referencing Salix, referencing the material Salix, um, and you can see what's getting returned straight away are multilingual records, so we're getting Swedish, Dutch, and English records returned from, from the various different data sets. Some of them are returned to, to Willow, um, some of them return to referring to Salix, and some of them may be referring to further down, some of them may be referring to some of those subtypes of those things. And so it, it, it hides all of the, the Sparkle querying uh, stuff that, that you have to do in the background, but what the query builder is doing is, is interactively generating a Sparkle query, and it can get quite complicated what it's actually uh, generating in the background, but you don't really have to think about it, the query builder is doing it for you. And I've given a little link to the query builder, it was, it was deployed onto CNRs, servers in PISA. I guess the servers are in PISA, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. CNR is in PISA anyway. Um, but it's there anyway if, if people want to have a look at it and play with it and try it out. So I mentioned these specialized associative relationships that exist in the AAT. Um, here again is a query to uncover them, to find them. Yeah, I've done a little, little Sparkle query uh, and we get back a list of them, there's 129 of them in total in the AAT. There's more in the, the, the Solus Geographic Names and the ULAN list of art, artist names as well. And you can see the kind of things, they're a bit, bit more flexible um, semantics than, than formal ontologies. Um, each of them is, is described as the domain and range is just a concept, but the scope note then defines what kind of concepts they are between. And so you can see some of them go, are bridges between different facets in the thesaurus structure. You now we've got um, any type of concept referring to any type of concept, but then you've got events referring to things. Um, yeah. Locus or setting referring to things, that sort of thing. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different things there that we might use in the context of our, our queries and find new relationships, as I say, between our data items. Um, and then there's actually a whole other structure in these associative relationships over and above the usual hierarchy that you see in vocabularies uh, because of these specialized relationships. So here's an example of um, uh, grapes, winemaking. Um, yeah, winemaking is, is uh, a process, an activity, so it's in the activities facet, but it's connected with the activity of viticulture, yeah, which is the focus of the genus. Vitis, yeah. Uh, so you can see a, a whole other thing with a lot of different bridges between those different um, facets in the vocabulary. And so we can, we can perform some specialized um, queries on these relationships and find new relationships between them. So here's a little query again. Um, it's a, more of a thematic query. So we're finding connections between types of objects, but those objects are not necessarily clustered together in the thesaurus like that, yeah? In, in under a, connect, a convenient parent term of shoemaker's tools or something like that. They're in different parts of the vocabulary, but we can pull them together through commonality of the uh, relationship that they have there. So I'm doing a query um, where shoemakers use things. And so what things do shoemakers use? And we get back a list of things that they use. We've got a kind of thematic connectivity between those things. And again, if you plug that into your own data, you've got data indexing those, those IDs 
you can do thematic connections on your data. So there's 129, as I say, distinct specialised relationship types just in the Getty AAT that we can employ and use. There's another 124 in ULAN and 21 for the source of geographic names. So I think it's a bit of an untapped resource, really. Uh, you can create useful chains of relationships between these concepts. You can find structures like I did there, where there's, there's a whole other substructure going on that you wouldn't necessarily immediately see just if you're just looking at the hierarchy. And some of these relationships encompass bridging links between the different facets of the thesaurus. So you're finding relationships between activities and types of objects or materials and types of activities, things like that. And you can discover clusters of semantically related concepts, which again, if you're plugging that in in the context of your data, then you're discovering clusters of records which have got new connections between them. And we can infer new connectivity between those records indexed using those concepts. That's me. Yeah, try out those things online. Um, and uh, thank you very much.